go. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest has written and illustrated over 200 books for children and adults. Many have been translated into more than 30 languages and have become successful animated television series that are enjoyed by children all over the world. The total sales of his books have exceeded 42 million copies worldwide. His work can be found in the permanent collections of the Maza Museum of Art, Dodd Center of the University of Connecticut, Curlin Collection at University of Minnesota, and the Grumman Collection at the University of Southern Mississippi. As a noted speaker, he has been inspiring audiences around the world with his spiritual and life-affirming concepts that he shares in many of his books. Welcome to the show, Hans Wilhelm. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm great. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. You reached out uh, maybe about a month ago, and I was able to look at your work, and the second I clicked on one of your videos and saw the webpage, I knew I had to have you on. You have... Uh, such incredible videos all over YouTube on many different spiritual topics, a lot of things that are uh, common issues for people, but you, your videos are so simple and you've really kind of deduced to the core message of these uh, things like depression or soulmates or things like that. So maybe you can just, uh, for people who don't know you, just give a little bit of a, a background on, on your work and, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> As you can hear, I was born in Germany, but I lived in Africa and America for a long time now. But uh, all my life, I was interested in the spiritual uh, subjects. Uh, when I grew up, there was no internet, so there were also no real books available. Very, very frustrating. And anyway, I, but I got through and I studied many, many paths. And I stayed in the commun uh, in the communal living for seven years and so on. And, uh, but I always kept it pretty much to myself. It wasn't really part of my work, which I did as a writer and illustrator for children's books. I separated that. But um, it was only a few years, well, something like uh, 15 years ago when my father died. And my father um, was, had a very eventful life. But when he died, he knew very well that after death, there would be nothing left because he was, a prison, he was in the war, a soldier. He has seen death all his life and he was absolutely convinced that life would be over when he dies. And um, we all respected that in our family and he was quite, quite content with it. So in his last few days, uh, when he couldn't speak anymore, but he could listen, I, I, we four children, we rotated and were with him all the time. Then I was with him at first period and I told him, look that I know yet you don't believe life continues after death. And you may be right, but just in case you are not, and you may be surprised that you're not dead, these are the things you may experience. This happens probably when you are on the other side. So I really listed all the things which I knew pretty well of uh, that they were happening on the other side. And um, he just listened to it, smiled, and said, all right, this is your belief, I, uh, I, I have my belief. And then a few days later, he died, and I totally forgot about this. It was only five years later when I went to a book signing of a medium um, who was well respected and now everybody raved about him when I wanted to meet him because he was so special. He was very young. And um, I came very early to this book signing to make sure I got a seat and the room was empty and I sat down. I was going to my little meditation when somebody tapped me on the shoulder and he says, uh, I'm Roland Comtoy, who was the, the author. And uh, when you came in, I just saw your father coming in as well. And he ran to me and he said, please, this is my son. Speak to him and tell him that whatever he told me uh, before I died was true. And it helped me so much to understand it. And then he said, uh, when I'm now here seeing of how many souls are coming, dying, so the quote, dying in quotes, and arriving here and are totally confused. They don't know what happens. So I don't know where they are. Would I please start writing books about this because of all the knowledge which I have? And uh, well, I wasn't quite sure about that. And I also, he also mentioned some other personal things which I was pretty sure that came from my father. So I thought about it and um, because I wasn't ready to write another spiritual book, there are already many enough <laughs> in the market. And I also wanted to reach young people. I mean, young people don't really read their books that much anymore. 
So in a meditation came the idea to do videos. So that's how I started my channel called lifeexplained.com. And in this, I do videos from five to 10 minutes long, some a little bit longer, where I draw visually how or everything relates, how the law of karma relates and where it is stored and how everything else works and how the fall took place and how the energies and thought patterns work and so on. I draw this because I've been illustrating books for a long time. And it's just one of my talents. And I do this also very much for myself. I'm still learning all the time. And when I really have a complex idea about, let's say, loneliness or whatever it is, and I really think deeply about it and study and so on, and then draw it out visually of what it actually means visually, then I can understand it much, much better. And so I do it for myself. And then I share it, put it on the on YouTube and on my website, lifeexplained.com. And uh, all these videos are for free. There is no membership. There's nothing to pay. There's nothing uh, uh, to, be, to join. And I just put them out there. And they grew such so suddenly. I mean, uh, I was totally surprised. And uh, the feedbacks are, have been also very tremendous. And uh, that's what I'm doing. And so uh, now I like to speak with people like you who have got a different audience who may be interested in these videos uh, to just check them out. And that's basically my idea. As I said, this is not my money making basis. That's what I do in writing. I still keep on writing books for children and adults, but I do this as a side on the side. And uh, every month I think I release a new little video about spiritual topics. And I think um, there's still a lot more to cover, but I've, so far I think there are 60 videos. That's amazing. I, that's an incredible origin story as well about your father. I'm sorry to hear that, but it's interesting that you had a, a confirmation and then that's what comes out of it. And what I, well, I like a lot of that, um, but it's interesting that this is the thing that you're doing on the side that you know that can help people. You know, you, a lot, I think a lot of people in, let's say, the conscious community or, or just in the world, you know, you need to make a living. You know, you might work wherever but then you have this thing on the side and I think that it's important to when you get that understanding and that feeling and that knowing that you can make something that can help somebody you know it might not be your your um, money maker at first but it's something that really is going to help because you have really incredible topics on there you have uh, loneliness you know you have you have things that a lot of people are, are struggling with and if your video as you and I discussed on the beginning you said you know if this episode can help one person if our conversation can help one person feel better then you know we've we've offered something from our hearts if you come from your heart you know maybe you don't know where that's going to go and you can just show up your best um so i'm curious about the things that you told your father um because interestingly enough i just reposted an old podcast i did with frank ostaseski who's a co-founder of zen hospice and this man, he wrote the five invitations, five invitations, what death can teach us about fully living and just helping thousands of people cross over. And he's a older gentleman, really beautiful guy, really humble um, and really lived the path for a long time. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are um, about, you know, what what is possible or what do you think happens after we die and how maybe that can help us live a more fulfilled now, more fulfilling life. I made it, one of the video is the 10 surprises you will have when you're dying, when you're dead. And um, I, of course, I can't list them ahead, but some of them, of course, the most important one for people is that you're not dead. I mean, this is, we take this for granted, anybody who has been on the spiritual path, but it's not the general assumption. People do not live or they do not believe that necessarily. They may know that there is something like God or whatever, etc. But in our day-to-day -day life, people do not live with the awareness that when the day of the transition comes, that they will continue, their consciousness will continue, their knowing, even their ego, their whole personality will continue. So there will not, also there will not make majorly changes, there will not be suddenly enlightened, only but death does not enlighten us. We continue basically on the same frequency. Also that uh, when we die, there will be most likely some light beings, we call them spiritual beings or angels or whatever it is, who will help us to proceed to the next step of where we have to be. Again, this is very important to know because I hear over and over again, a lot of people who are not aware that there is life after death suddenly find themselves surrounded by one or two of these light beings and they feel so ashamed and so worthless compared to this light being that they, are, that they don't want to approach them. They just feel 
I cannot speak to them. I'm not worthy enough. Not knowing that they came to help. But this is a very common effect that some people just feel, this I can't communicate. And they turn away and go somewhere. And some of them even become earthbound because of this. Because they do not feel worthy enough to approach uh, the guardian spirit or any other angel who comes to pick them up and move them on. And then, of course, there is, of course, the, the likelihood that we may eventually see uh, relatives who have died, and even those who have not died for some reason, but they, they are there on the other side to welcome us. And very important for some people is also the fact that most likely very beloved pets are there waiting for us too. And um, so then, of course, um, this is usually a positive event, but of course, everybody dies differently. People who really have a very miserable or make their life miserable or a lot of pain not necessarily have a very beautiful transition. I mean, we know the near-death experiences, some of them are really horrible because the frequency is really, if I am a horrible person, I'm attracted to horrible on the other side. And that is a horrible environment. It's totally, we are living totally or by the law of like attracts like. And this applies particularly when we die. Therefore, it is so important as your friend said, to now work on ourselves so that our vibration gets higher, so that we come into a higher vibration after death. So that is a great opportunity. But some people really destroy their life. They are really, in, in a way, um, taken over by evil thoughts and action and so on. And they can, of course, have a little different life exp experience after death, which will correspond with their soul. That we, that's where we are attracted to, to the sphere of development which corresponds to where we are. The sad things, what I hear from the spiritual world over and over again, is that the majority of people are basically going back where they were before. Only a very small group goes onto a higher level, have worked themselves enough here on the earth to go onto a higher level. And of course, there's also a quite a substantial amount of people who go to the spiritual world on a lower level because they have misused their life here on earth. We are only here for 800,000 hours. That's a very, very, very short time. And in these 800,000 hours, we are giving tasks every day of the answer to everything is love. I mean, there isn't, there isn't much secret here. It's to be loving. I mean, this is all. That's a basic, simple thing, to love everything. Love ourselves, love everybody else, and everything as well. And God always says, love, nothing else. That is all we have to do. It sounds very uh, new age tried and uh, larifari, but, and it's not easy, but it is the only answer to absolutely everything. There is no exception. And when we do this, our vibration increases and we will then also be attracted to a corresponding higher vibration on the other side. I think these are probably the most important points of uh, what I mentioned, but there may be some other. Those who are interested in, they can see my video um, the 10 surprises when you die on lifeexplained.com. I love it, man. It's going to be easy to just dive down so many rabbit holes. I could literally just pick one of your videos and have you explain um, each one and it'd be valuable. Uh, but what that makes me kind of think about is what for you, you know, because when we, when we open this discussion, you've been on the spiritual path for a long time. So you were talking about, you know, going through each of these topics, you know, maybe it was Buddhism or whatever the case, like, can you, can you just talk about like some of your studies and how you got to this point? And I really like how you mentioned earlier, and I want to touch upon this, that, you know, for me being a martial artist or an athlete or somebody who likes to learn information, when I know it and I teach it to somebody, whether it's in a martial arts class or snowboarding, when I teach it, I integrate the knowledge much better because, and then I, um, I understand it more. I'm able to, you know, apply those principles even more. And the more simple you can get in your education and understanding and explanation, that kind of shows your level of mastery. And so you're taking these concepts like loneliness or life before birth or these spiritual concepts, um, death and dying, and you're making them very simple and very concise, which shows to me uh, a level of mastery, which I recognize in you. So I just wanted to share that and just you maybe have you touch a little bit on how you accumulated this knowledge and then were able to kind of refine it down. Well, I was very lucky that I had a lot of wonderful teachers, so living ones as well as dead ones uh, and so on. And I started, I actually, I started very first with TM and I was 19 or something like this. And then Edgar Casey and others and so on. And very and a lot of also teachers in from Germany uh, who's in German uh, and um, 
they, but what held me back was also the the words uh, walk your uh, walk your talk so not until you can master something should you speak about it and this helped me back because i knew i did not i still have to learn it myself and then i realized that many of the teachers to whom i was exposed never none of them are really walk, very few of them walked their talk totally they all limped their talk and thank god they limped their talk and talk because otherwise i wouldn't have known about it you see even with the limping at least i got something out from their from their sharing so i'm sharing my videos as well with the full understanding that i am as much on the path like everybody else and then we can work something out together like you do with your videos you you work yourself out together with you with your speakers etc you learn from it i learn from it and i think that is a key element that i was finally at to open myself so let it be i just go and talk and then hopefully it will be right because we only speak about that what we do not know or what we're not sure of. And if anything we should, are sure of, we do not speak about. So I speak about it, I speak my videos, so, because I am still working on it myself. I'm still integrating everything. I'm truly, I do it to remind myself daily on the tasks which I have every day, every minute, every second. So that's the reason why I do the videos. And the paths are many, many fold. I lived as a, in a spiritual community. Uh, in Germany for a while and so on and a lot of other stuff but what comes together is it comes the more I knew the more I learned it becomes simpler and simpler and simpler I started off with very very difficult words for Rudolf Steiner so difficult to read and Edgar Casey also difficult to read and the more and more I, I grasp it put it together straightforward language and i realized when you really go within and speak with god and god speaks with you and it's, my stuff is not channeled don't get me wrong but it's my personal communication it's a straightforward language there is no convoluted language or sentences it goes straightforward for me it's very key god is ingenious simplicity and it's ingenious uh, um, intelligence and that, I think, is the key, to make it very simple, very clear. I do not believe that God is hiding anything from us, like the churches like to tell us, this is God's mystery, why we die, why we're here, and why some people suffer. This is all BS. It is all very clear. It's very easy to understand. And I think once you, understand, you believe, understand the, the law of uh, reincarnation and karma, these two elements, I think suddenly everything makes sense in the world. Wherever you look, whatever you see, you see people in a grand situation and poor situation and war and peace, and suddenly it all comes together. And there is not really a question answered anymore, uh, unanswered because it's very clear. And the fact is that Christ taught reincarnation makes it so shocking that we in the Western world had to learn it from the East more or less. But Christ was very clear speaking about reincarnation and, and uh, there are several quotes in the Bible as well as also his teaching which came afterwards. He made it very clear. So once we understand that this is not only, only our own visit here to this planet Earth but has been properly many, many before and what our day is today is nothing but the seed uh, of uh, the, the harvest of what we have sown in the past, everything suddenly makes sense, to me at least. That's wonderful. Well, you, you touched on a lot of things there that I want to dive into. This weekend, I was with uh, David Lombert Senapas, who's a native elder of the Mi'kmaq Nation, um, and he has beautiful teachings. He, he has a totally different upbringing than we do. Um, and this is ancient knowledge from his tribe that he's sharing. And um, we were with uh, our friends Kim and Bruce. And uh, Bruce, I think, was a psychologist or therapist, and Kim has been in healing forever. And uh, one of the questions that I get to a lot that I wonder about is just suffering. You know, why is it that all of a sudden, you know, maybe I, I, something terrible happens to me. Right. And you know, it's like, Oh, one of the things that I'll talk about is like taking a hundred percent responsibility. So maybe I get a disease out of nowhere. You know, I take responsibility or something terrible happens. And people are like, I didn't ask for that. And it kind of see, seems shitty to say like, Oh, you know, I asked for that somehow. And Kim's reflection was karma. She's like, oh, you know, well, maybe you had karma in a past life. And that's how I kind of have that um, understanding. And what I realized when she said that is like, 
the pursuit of spiritual knowledge or conscious knowledge for me is the ability to put a lens on that makes us feel a little bit better, but it has to be a real, real lens. So if everything is like terrible in life and everything is like a dark lens and it's all terrible, that's not good. But if you can find a perspective that allows you a little bit more freedom, a little bit more openness, a little bit more love and kindness, um, a little bit more acceptance then that that can be useful and you can kind of put that lens on so i'm just curious for you if you wanted to go a little bit deeper into your thoughts on karma and the reincarnation process if you feel like those are really important things for people to understand because i don't think i've gone really deep on those two concepts on the podcast before <clears throat> yeah how uh, where to begin karma is of course a very big uh, subject karma is uh, Let's put it that way. <clears throat> we, whatever we do, uh, any action, every, any sensation, any thought, any uh, the words we speak and any action um, is stored con immediately in our body, in our cells, in our soul, what we call our soul, and also in the Akashic records which surround the globe. And then, most importantly, in the um, uh, repository planets of the material and uh, semi-material universe. These are the planets, these are the stars. That's where horoscopes came from long time ago. So this is where our karma, what we do is continuously stored. Whatever we do has a vibration. All life is a vibration, nothing else. That's what Einstein said already. So according like attracts like. So our action is attracted to certain planets, to whatever in, in, in the universe. That's where it's stored. It's exactly the same as we have got the Sputniks and all the satellites around the planet Earth. They also store the stuff and send it back when the time comes right. Now, these planets are moving continuously. They're moving. All planets are moving. And when they reach a certain kind of formation or are full, they down, download the karma back to the person who has sown it, like a flex like. So we are getting this back. We are not necessarily getting it back in our lifetime. This is probably 60% we get back in our lifetime. But there's a lot of stuff which comes at back in another lifetime. So that's how karma, very simplistic. In my video, how karma works, you can see it very slower and explain. But what we have to realize that whatever we do gets stored instantly, gets recorded. It's like in a computer where everything gets recorded and it is, uh, it is there. And it will come back to us when the time is right. And it always comes back to us. Let's say something big like an illness comes back to us. It doesn't come back right away, boing. It always comes with warnings. We always get warning. This is luck. The whole karma law, although it is not a part of the love of the absolute reality, but it is a gentle way of love to, so that we learn to love in a way. If I'm nasty to you right now and I get it back in some other way, so I learn probably through my own suffering that it is a much better way to be nice to people. So basically we get our old, old BS back so that we reflect on it and understand that the only way to have a Beautiful life for oneself and for the rest of all our neighbors is through love. And there is just no exception ever to that. And karma teaches us that continuously. And this also includes loving our body. Like smoking and stuff like this is not a very loving action to do. And the, the result will be maybe lung cancer or whatever it is. So that is the whole universe works on this basically cause and effect. It's a causal law which is outside of reality. Which, in which we are now. We are in the temporary reality or the illusion. And here we have to deal with our karma. and We create karma all this time and our day-to-day -day existence is nothing than the harvest of seeds that we have sown long time ago. So where we are now, what community we are in, where the family we are born in, um, the country we are live in, is also part of our karmic um, experience. We have started it a long time ago. So we can never blame anybody. Blaming doesn't help anyway. Even blaming ourselves is not a good idea. But we cannot blame the politicians in, in Washington. We cannot blame, we cannot, our, uh, the bad mother-in-law, whatever it is, it's just not possible. We have created that. And it's, everybody is only here because we ask them to come into our life to teach us a lesson of love. There's nobody coming into our life for any other reason. So this is basically life in a very in a nutshell that we are experiencing what we have sown a long time ago. And Jesus has spoken about it many, many, many times, the law of sowing and reaping and whatever it is. So it, it's, it's something which is very fundamentally part of the teachings of the Christian religion and as well as the Eastern religion.
It's just only that the church, it's not the church, it was uh, an uh, emperor, uh, oh, I forgot his name. He took it out in the fifth century uh, because he thought he was the ruler of the church. I made a video on this one a long time ago. It's called Reincarnation Part Two of how the Christian teaching was, uh, was, yeah, was totally changed, not by the church so much, but by an emperor. And so they took out the uh, teaching of reincarnation of many lives, which the original church fathers always taught, and we have got their writings. But they took it out so that you had to really join the church to save your soul. Because reincarnation, you don't have to join anything. If reincarnation exists, you don't have to join anything. You can just live without it. But this was one way to keep a real tight control over the people. So there we have the most important teaching, I think, which is a law of reincarnation and karma, which was taken out in the Western world. And uh, we uh, pay a dear price for it because we have become very self-centered, self-egoistic, uh, me, me, me generation, etc. Because, well, who cares? I'm not, I'm only, I only live once, you know, this famous saying, which is not true. And the, the idea that we only should live once has caused so much pain in our own life because our selfish and self-centered life in the end always causes us tremendous pain and uh, to others as well as uh, in the end to ourselves. And um, this is where all the confusion is. You look at this country here at the moment, the drugs and so on, it's, it's so high that people want to ex escape. Their life is very, very hard and very, very tough. And they don't know where, they don't know exactly why they're here and what for what reason. So, so many people try to escape and it's not the drugs only. I mean, the most important, I think, escape these days is the internet. The internet is a total tool of escapism. And um, again, this is so very important Coming back to karma, as I said earlier, when a sort of a major blow of fate comes or something serious comes, like an illness or whatever, accident, etc., the planets keep sending us little warning signs. And these warning signs we feel in our solar plexus. I don't feel well today. There's something is wrong, something is odd, etc., etc. I feel, ah, I feel, and the first thing we often say, an anxiety, or I feel bored. Boredom is, I don't want to be where I'm right here. Boredom is a sign I want to be away from where I am right now. I do not want to deal with the emotion of feeling that is coming up in me right now. And when we do the opposite and face this boredom, it says, what does this want to say to me? What's happening here? I have a great morning. Yet now suddenly I feel funny because something said something. What is happening? And learn to explore, self-discover ourselves. That is how we make the changes. But instead, what we are now can do, because we have got this instant little machine here, the moment we feel bad, we click on this one, and two clicks, and I'm a different wonder world. And we, I do not deal with my emotions. And then three weeks later, boom, the doctor says you have got lung cancer. That is something which, which is a sad thing that we so easily are distracted and are, are bored. I made a video, a TED talk, actually, uh, I gave on... on uh, how boredom is can be a very creative force. I did this. Uh, I was also trying to avoid my boredom, and um, had several instances where I felt certain emotions. And I normally would have had a that was before computers and, and television. I and um, then I stuck with it and I listened to it. And out of this, I became understood where it came from, from childhood or whatever it is. And I created all these stories and I started a whole book club just by facing my boredom. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Anybody who feels bored, don't go to the next distraction. Sit, close your eyes, ask your guide, God, whatever, what does it want to tell me? What does it remind me of? Childhood, whatever it is, explore it, find it, and love it. Send it loving energy. And then you will learn from it. Anyway, that's so much enough. <laughs> Did you get any questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, and that's that's a really wonderful point. And you know, I think you hit the nail on the head with saying that the phone is one of the key distractions. And that's what um, I haven't done it yet. It's one of the checks that I need to get is a Vipassana meditation where you basically meditate all day, every day for 10 days. I have done long sits of meditation before, like for months, and you know, pretty much that's that's all I did. But that's a big 
thing is the boredom and you want to get out. You, you want to do something. That's why so many people don't meditate because it's, you, you need to do something. And I'll say right now, I am a hundred percent guilty of grabbing my phone and checking on the stupid likes or whatever or comments. And I'll say, okay, like I'd be off social media if it weren't for me needing to post the, the podcast and things like that. And some of that is true. It's very true because I don't want to go on. I, I just post content, but then I look, but then I post it and I'm going about my day. I don't need to go check every five minutes, you know, but I'll go and I'll go check and I'm like, F, shoot, you know, but I'll catch myself and you need to figure that out. And some people do it through eating. Some people do it through cigarettes. Some people do it through um, all these different ways, but a really sneaky one is the phone and it's social media and it's gaming because we don't want to face that boredom. So I think that that is a, just a really brilliant piece of information I wanted to kind of double down on um, because it's so important. You know, it's so important. And what comes out of it, it you're kind of going into the depths, into the dirt, into the darkness. And when we talk about darkness or shadow work, it's just the uncomfortable feelings. We're not supposed to feel good all the time, you know? You know, that's that's a part of life. If, if somebody, I have a sister, you know, if somebody punches my sister in the face, the feeling I'm not going to have instantly is love. You know, it's, it's going to be a different one. Um, and I might take an action. Ideally, I don't beat the crap out of them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel anger and different things. So that's okay. But after that, we got to explore these parts of ourselves, boredom, anxiety, depression, loneliness. And if we can just sit in that a little bit, we're going we're gonna to come out with something. We're going to get a golden nugget that is in that, that darkness. So you can either add on to what I just said if you feel like or go a little bit into um, reincarnation and what you think happens because I'm curious with the follow-up question that I'm going to ask is, do you think we can get out of this wheel of karma? And so the thought that I have is I remember reading the autobiography of a yogi and uh, his master comes back and he tells him about the next realm. And he says, you know, I do the same thing in that realm that I do here on earth. I was helping people ascend to the next realm so they don't need to get reincarnated. Well, in this next stage, I'm doing the same thing. I'm kind of guiding people. And you and I, I think can see the difference between somebody who might be not accumulating a lot of karma, having a little bit more peace, having a little bit more understanding, a little bit more kindness, a little bit more love. They're going to have a different life experience somebody who's in a lot of anger, a lot of pain, a lot of, uh, you know, taking from trying to screw people over, you know, you can't live a fulfilling life like that. It's just, I don't think it's possible. Maybe it is. I, and I don't know yet. Um, so maybe you can just speak on reincarnation a little bit, how that works to you. And if we can, what we can do now to kind of go to a level that would be uh, maybe graduation from grade six to seven or maybe just from kindergarten to grade one if we're lucky because we're still killing each other so we got some work to do yeah we are here probably on the lowest level and, uh, my understanding and i'm sharing here my understanding is that outside of the pure heaven from where we all once came and through the what we the story calls the fall we separated ourselves we had selfish thoughts separate ourselves like attracts like and we couldn't stay in the pure heavens anymore which is the divine heaven and so we are now outside of the pure heaven. And my understanding is there are major se seven layers. And these seven layers have seven sub layers. And you do different teachings, different numbers. But there are layers. And the lowest one is the matter here as well. The lowest frequency. Is, it's all frequency. The lowest one is matter. So we are now here on matter. And it is the first four levels which require reincarnation. Wherever we are, we are if we are our awareness on level two or level three, we still come usually back to reincarnation. And then on the fourth level, we not necessarily have to, but then from the fourth level onwards, the, what we call the God force pulls us to the next one. So we no longer have to reincarnate. Now, reincarnation is not necessarily something negative. It is something very positive. As I said earlier, it's only 800,000 hours for most of us. It's a very short visit. It's like you and I going to the movies for three hours and escaping in, in, in Star Wars. This happens in, and then go back to normal life. And the same thing is reincarnating. 800,000 hours compared to eternity is absolutely just nothing. So we decide to come here because here on earth we have the opportunity to undo our karma the fastest possible way. Largely because we are here on earth in a very unique situation. We are surrounded by a lot of other people of different frequency, different vibration, different awarenesses. 
when we are in the spiritual world, like attracts like very strongly, we are like only between similar people. And we have got, we are surrounded by people who think like us, act like us, etc. All the robbers are together, all the saints or whatever. It's, it's very boring. There's very little friction, very little growth. The other thing, we also do not have a physical buff, uh, body which buffers karma. An illness, for instance, in our body is a buffered karma. In the spiritual world, we also have our karma. And there we don't have the body. We feel the karma much, much stronger. So there is a strong desire for souls to incarnate. We are not forced to come here. We want to because we understand this is like going to college. I, uh, one of my videos is the amazing uh, college earth or school earth, college earth. It is college. And when we go to college for a few years, we don't mind all the difficulties, etc. But we know we learn something tremendous there which can help us later in life. And so with this mindset, most souls incarnate here, want to incarnate. The problem is there aren't enough babies. There are more souls want to incarnate than there are babies. And the other thought is also that unfortunately in the more um, first world uh, countries, there are even far less babies. So a lot of souls who may not have needed a very difficult life because they could have gone in a more affluent lifestyle still choose to go somewhere in africa or asia into the poorest area just to be incarnated even if their life wasn't really requiring such a difficult life environment but the desire to incarnate is very strong today there are also souls who incarnate for the lust of it they want to go back because they need the body they want to screw they want whatever it is as is here this is where i can have my fun and these souls are there as well. They are not advised. Usually before we incarnate, we get advice from our guardian spirit to tell us exactly what we have to expect. All the pitfalls, the highs and lows, the dangers, and we have to agree with it. We also may do some soul contracts with other souls who also incarnate with us at the same time to be our adversary, so instance, or our helper, whatever. So we make these arrangements and then we incarnate. And um, so this, uh, the whole inca reincarnation, I hear many people say, oh, what can I do to no longer in my email to incarnate, to, that I stop my reincarnation because I don't want to come back here again. So my answer is this, when you understand that your only purpose of life is love and service, you may want to come and incarnate to help others. So that's another reason, to help others. You want to see that everybody else also comes and be it comes into higher frequency. So it's not so much about us. In the end, it's always about others. The whole universe is nothing else than service. That's beautiful, man. I, t I totally agree. You want to keep going? <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I see you. you're ready to open your mouth. Keep going. Keep laying it on me. It's great. Well, yeah. But no, I think that at the moment, I, I, I think that I stop here. So like, as I said, I've got this is various wonderful short videos. One is the Earth, the amazing Earth alive. And also life before birth is very, very good. I mean, how we plan our life together with our guardian spirits together. And we see actually what's going to happen. And we know that the disasters we have there, we know it in advance. So when we have it later in our life here as coming back as karma, how can it happen to me? Now, we have agreed to that bullshit because it helps us to cleanse ourselves right now if we deal right with it. So we knew we would have an illness. We knew we would have a handicap. We knew we would have a horrible uh, life experience, etc. Uh, because we need that challenge. The same like you with your skateboarding, without challenges, you couldn't have grown. The same like a student goes to, to college, without challenges, we cannot grow. And we accept them as challenges. But once we are down here, and we are faced with all that stuff. We don't see it as a challenge. We see it as a curse. We see it as a horrible. And uh, yeah. And yep. the, other th the other thing, which is another point. Uh, you have a question? I don't want. No, no, keep going, please. <laughs> I think the other person, I think we, I think we must not overlook, and it took me a while to really come to grips with this, it's, it's very important, is that when what we call the fall happened, when a lot of souls left the, 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 the um, this pure heavens, there were what we call destructive energies. We call them demons or whatever it is, devils, whatever. I don't want to go too much into these. But these energies are still here. They're surrounding us. 
and they're continuously trying to draw energy from us. And we open ourselves often up to them and let them draw the energy from us. And I do have uh, several uh, videos on this. One is called Evil, also on spirit possessions, possessions and, and so on. So there is a lot of stuff which, in spite of being at all this wonderful um, clockwork where everything works with karma and so on, there's also this negative energy which continuously bombards us, challenges us, and pulls us away from being love and being loving, being angry uh, and doing exactly the opposite. Because if we are angry, if we are fighting, if we are uh, suffering or whatever it is, we are oozing out energy, loose energy. And that is the energy which the negative forces suck up and dream. They're because they no longer have energy. Then they use our energy. And they use it in military, they use it in everywhere in, in our whole system. I don't want to make it too big that we're all afraid of it, but I want it to be, us to be aware of it, that there is this energy. And whenever I let myself go in a whatever direction, which means negative or whatever it is, I'm opening myself up to that energy. They are so, so very smart. They know exactly, because they can see our aura. They know exactly what our weakness is. And they easily can jump in and give us a, some, some inspiration. I just... Um, Remember the wonderful story of Dr. F of Faust by Goethe. It's an old story, just very brief. It's about this. It's probably the most well known German drama. Um, but it's basically about a senior citizen, an elderly, very studied gentleman um, who is a doctor. And uh, he dabbles with uh, metaphysics and he the, the pentagram and so on. And suddenly, in no time, suddenly the devil is next to him, metaphysical. And Mephisto knows exactly what he wants. And Mephisto is smooth talking. And with a hologram, basically, he shows them the body of a nude young girl. And, and he is, of course, also, yes, that's what I want, etc. He knows exactly what it is. And so he says, well, I can make you young. You can have this girl, etc., etc." And he makes a deal with the devil. That's what we call it. And he signs with blood. His soul away he says, who cares for my soul? I want that girl. So, of course, then the story goes on. He gets this girl, he gets to look younger, get the girl, and then she gets a baby and commits suicide or whatever. So, it's a dreadful story. But what it is, is basically that they know, they know exactly what our weak point is. They know exactly, is it sex, is it drugs, is it whatever it is. And they feed us continuously. And they know. And the, the thing is, and I come back to the major distraction, and I made a video on this one, technology, the, uh, the negativity of technology, it is the internet. Somebody sent me a wonderful um, email around about how the internet, had, all the apps, there are now apps of the seven deadly sins, you know, the seven deadly sins like lust and greed and so on. And I didn't know, it was, I don't think I get them all together, but gluttony is Yelp, uh, uh, hate is Twitter, um, Facebook is uh, pride, no, for Facebook is envy, and uh, Instagram is, is, is pride. Um, I don't get them all together. Oh yeah, sex is Tinder. And so on. So you have got the seven major sins and there is an app for it. In other words, whatever our weaknesses are in life, one click, one app, and it's there for us. It was never before possible. It is so quick and so seductive. So whatever our weakness is, one click only and we can have it satisfied. And to say no to this and to be strong enough and to understand that this is only a manipulation from the negative side who wants our energies that needs some strength and some uh, focus in life man that was amazing um okay the seven deadly sins you listed i think five and that is a brilliant point that i have never heard of okay so wait what are the what are the other two? What ones did we miss? Do you can you? No, I, I'm not good at it. This is a while ago, and I just you see, I'm not sure. I'm I'm googling it right now because because uh, I, I don't it, know exactly what the apps were, but they were definitely perfect apps. Oh, greed and laziness are the two that you missed. Do you know what those apps are? It's probably YouTube. You know, people get so. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't, you don't have to read anything. You're not sorry. You get uh, well any, but I don't know greed anymore. But there was a greed one. Anyway, they are all. <laughs> All there. Maybe if I find it again, I'll send it to you. But it's, yeah, it's, yeah. If you think about it, let me know because that's it's super important. Because I'll tell you straight, I, like this podcast is on consciousness and spirituality. 
yeah. I am not above that. You know what I mean? I have gotten in times and I, and even recently, like I was just in a car and the, in the drive and I was like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing that? So it's, it's very seductive and it's instant and all this stuff happens in your brain, you know, little brain chemicals, stuff like that, um, that happens. So you form an addiction and your body is just doing that rather than just sitting and being bored. And it's a really, really important point because over time it's, you're going to mess up your life experience. You know, a day turns into two days, turns into a week, turns into a month, turns into a year, turns into a decade. That can happen at a blink of an eye. And when you're down here learning these different things, you can really get derailed. Um, I can see you want to make a comment, so jump in. No, no, I was just saying, not only after say, you need higher and higher stimulants. That's where the problem is. You start mm. with a very weak stimulants, and then you go higher and higher and higher to more extremes and more extremes, whatever they are. This is, doesn't stop. It's not the, the continuation, it's also the increase in stimuli, which we need whenever we do any of this uh, or the internet, whether any form of distraction we use there. It's a, it's a tool, uh, a double-edged sword, but it does have a very negative thing and we are not aware of it. We think we are so happy and I, do, I enjoy my GPS system. I'm <laughs> driving the car without it. I got totally rely on it. It's crazy. I threw my map, car maps away, which I had the printed one because you just don't need them anymore. But um, that, that's helpful. But yeah, the other things are there as well. Luring, lurking and waiting. And, uh, and then, yeah. Oh, then the, the, the lazy one, I think, was, was Netflix. <laughs> yeah. I may tweet somewhere else too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the lazy one would be Netflix. There's that, have you ever heard of the... Uh, like what is it netflix binge or there's a word for basically when you watch a whole series on netflix in a day um and i have done that before it's not good um but yeah i totally agree and i think that you know you're talking about these entities uh, i totally believe in these you know be, demon is a strong word just chill yeah. just say um little distracting fairies that are kind of like a holes and you know they're just steering you off the path but they're clever little buggers and they do feed off your energy and you can, and even if they don't exist, just monitor your own energy. So if you see somebody rage out, that's what they feed on, right? And even if they don't feed on it, just imagine all that energy going out into the universe and that's coming from you. You can direct that energy wherever the heck you want, but you've just given so much. And you see people in these loops of anxiety, anger, depression. And a lot of time, you know, I, you know, I, I know, I know some wealthy people that are doing it great. And I know some people that have all the money and you think that they should be fine, but they're some of the angriest people. And so that's not, that's not, um, you know, the solution just because you have money, you know, like they're trying, they're kind of in this model of taking and what happens is they take, 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 and they build and build and build and they have everything. They've got the cars, they've got the income, they've got the houses, but inside it's just dark and empty because they're running this model that, that there's never going to be enough to fulfill it, no matter how much darkness or thing. And then that kind of gets spouted out to the people around them. And so, you know, running that pattern, you're never going to feel fulfilled, but from that opposite place of love and service and kindness, you are now operating at a new frequency. Um, and I just wrote about this on Instagram the other day. Uh, the Dalai Lama had a really great quote just about, you know, being kind to each other and how that, you know, changes your life. You, you can't do that for anyone else. You can't experience what that feels like. But when you start to make those changes and just look a little bit, you know, you know one of the teachings that I really like from uh, David is three acts of kindness a day. And if you can just, you know, just start with that or even just do one for 27 days is another way to go about it. And you just start to think about your community and it, could you just imagine a thousand people or 10,000 people in one city that went around and did three acts of kindness a day because there's an energy that's exchanged and the person receiving feels that. And then the people who observe it also feel that, right? It's you're, you're, you're setting what this model is and that's how you build community and trust again, because we don't have trust. You know, we don't have connection. I can't even imagine what it's like to be a youth now. You know, I was, um, you know, athletic in high school and I had good friends and I was, you know, talented at, you know, different things, but I was terrified of high school. I was terrified of the girls. You know, I was terrified of the guys that were one year older 
and you didn't have this social thing to put up to know exactly how many friends you are, how cool you are. You didn't have those hurtful things said in school public for everybody to see. Um, no. So it's a challenging world. Um, so you can add on to that or I can formulate a question. You want to just remark on that? Yeah, I think everything is right. There are two things. This is, this is understanding the energy sucking. Let's just understand this is how all the wars going on in the Middle East. This is nothing. It's, it's purposely done for energy. This, this is baby harvesting feed for the things. And the other thing is very important, which we forget. When I am angry, I'm shooting out these red arrows all the time. That keeps my guardian spirit away because they can't come close to me because they, are, they have to protect themselves. So when I'm angry, I'm isolating myself from the only from the guide I have all the time with me, who usually communicates with me, usually through the solar plexus. But that is the other point. We do this, we keep everybody away from us when we are angry. Anyway, that was just a thought which I wanted to add, because people are not aware of how this is, how the, our negative vibrations are not only affecting the people around us, but also the people who are the souls who want to help us, the spirits who want to help us. Mm. That, that's a really good point. I'm glad you added that. And, you know, on the flip side, if there are demons and, and these ener energies, I do believe, and I think that you do as well, that we do have guides um, that are here to help us and they're on a higher vibration. And when you're in the vibration of kindness, compassion, happiness, love, you are then at a, you're operating higher, right? So, you know, people tell me about how dangerous the world is and how people are like this. I, I know it's a reflection of their consciousness because I've been traveling the world for seven years, all these different spots, all these different places, all these different environments. I don't really experience that. I can't really remember somebody coming out in my reality and just being a total dick to me. And even if they were, I would just, just be kind to them, you know, just because yeah. it has nothing to do with me. They obviously have a problem. So when someone's going around and everyone around them is a total a-hole, it's going to take you a bit of time to filter out your own consciousness and give them love. And, you know, spirituality or these teachings of kindness and compassion aren't when someone's like, oh, I'm such a spiritual person. No, I'm spiritual when I'm at home by myself meditating. I'm spiritual when I'm in my yoga little nook. I'm spiritual when I'm at my book club and everybody knows me and tells me how great I am. But as soon as I go outside and somebody gives me a little bit of like friction, it's like, F you, man, you suck. You don't know how spiritual I am. And it's like, what? Like whole teachings are for the time when that person doesn't understand for you to give them compassion. That's where the learning comes in. And when someone is challenging you because it's hard, then it becomes hard to do the thing, not easy. It's like, hey, Matt, I love your podcast. High five. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, thank you. And it's like, hey, Matt, you suck. Your podcast is the worst. You know what I mean? Like, F you, Tom, throw a rock at his car. You know, it's just like, that's not, that's, and it hurts, right? It actually, that the challenge is because it hurts for a bit. And over time, as you learn to like alchemize that feeling, that negativity and just hold that energy might not be positive. You are going to learn from that, right? Because really it's going to come down to my own self worth. You know, who is this random person to tell me? And even if it's true, you know, you suck at skateboarding. I do. I just started, you know, it's not very nice, man. <laughs> you know, So well, the, key is, the key is, does it, does the negative comment of the other person uh, evoke any emotional reaction in me or not? If they are really off course or say something stupid, like you're a stupid green hair person, then you just know it doesn't, because I don't have green hair, so obviously he must be wrong, etc. But if he says something which you deep down have doubts about yourself, boom, full target, a bullseye. And that's why they're there coming to us so that we find out who we are. The outside world is, as you say, nothing else than a reflection of who we are. It's a mirror. It's, uh, I made a video on this one, a short one, it's called The Law of Projection. Whatever we project, our thoughts, our beliefs, we see. And if we want to change the world around us, we have to change our beliefs within ourselves. That's basically what you're saying as well. You, just, you have a different belief traveling the world than other people have. And therefore, you see the world differently as well. Mm -hmm. you don't, uh, the dangers and so on. Others see the dangers because they're afraid of themselves. Yeah, exactly. And I really like that too, because when I was talking about the perspective lenses, you know, like you can go through like the, the dark gray lens, or you can be rose colored lens, and they can be the same reality. So for me, like when somebody is doing that, like, hey, Matt, 
you're a worthless piece of crap. They've thrown out a fishing line, right? And they're hooking, they're seeing what, what kind of fish they're going to get in me of my energy and my direction of my own life. And boom, if I attach to that, right, I take the, I take the bait, you know, I take the bait and I eat it and I'm like, oh man. And then I'm just, then, then now they've got me and I'm just like flapping around. Um, but from the perspective of an opportunity to learn, I can then throw on some rose colored glasses, not to say, Hey, this isn't existing. It's to, it's to flip that microscope back in. What about me? doesn't feel good enough. And I can have compassion for those people out there because that's the biggest thing is, you know, um, is being able to love ourselves completely to be able to be kind to ourselves for whatever reason is like the most challenging thing. And, you know, I use myself as the example where like, you know, I'm fit, you know, I, I like have like a six pack. I'm good at sports. I like travel the world. I do cool things. And like, I don't feel love all the time. You know, I'm just like so terrible to myself. And I have like what you would think was like an easier path, you know, white guy, friends, you know, things that just make it a little bit easier. And I still feel like a total a-hole more than I should. And it's like this learning process. But when I can just allow, and it's all the external stuff that hurts, you know, and I'm like, man, I'm like this bearded guy. I could go beat that guy up. And that's what I think, you know, <laughs> I'll just go beat up that guy who's talking shit to me on the internet. Who's probably like 12 year old kid, you know, playing video games and just talking shit to me on the side, but it hurts. And that's just my own work, right? Putting on a lens to just go back in and to find more love for myself and release anything that I'm, that I'm holding on to. So maybe you can speak a little bit on some tips for just being a little bit more loving and kind to ourselves. Well, the question, I mean, I also get emails which are uh, uh, challenging, let's put it that way, where they're really people are really misunderstood it or come from a very different point. And, and it says, and I ask myself, says, okay, do I now answer from my ego? It says, how dare you say that? <laughs> I says, look, this is his belief or her belief. Leave it, send them love and bless them. And I, I do that and that helps very easily, but I, they can challenge the ego as well. And it's basically the ego, which is sort of this, how dare they do that to me? And don't they know how much work and I did into this and so on? I know it's just all, all there for me to understand that uh, uh, there is still a lot of ego going on. And when you, when you respond, it, it's not necessarily there are problems in you as well. It's just your ego, which is just, how dare they do that to me? And uh, there we have to really understand this is, you know, everybody has their own dance and we have to let them be there. The problem, of course, we always have, and many of us, we all have things, is this, that we always feel superior to other people. I mean, that is our, and we are very critical about other people and we judge them easily and we always think we are superior. And that is some, that's a typical ego trip. And uh, I think we need many life. I need many lifetimes to get <laughs> that done. But it is something because we are totally with our own thought flexes uh, come, thinking. And I notice this as well, coming back to the to technology again, with young people and so on. The isolation of young people. I mean, when we, when I grew up, I had lots of friends, acquaintances. I was out in the street. I was doing, I was doing things like you did with your skateboard. But today, I live here with a lot of young kids and I never see kids in the street. It's like they don't have kids here. They live all inside. They must all be on the computer. The wonderful weather, no kid plays anyway that, that I see here. A very young kid maybe with the parents on a playground. That's the only thing. So I don't know. The only communication they have is with the internet. They're totally, and this can isolate you more than anything else. As you said, your likes and friend numbers, etc., etc., and the comments. And that is it's really horrible, I think. This is really, really sad that there is not this natural interaction anymore like we used to have. But I'm yeah. Just... yeah, it's a really important point. And I just wanted to say that you've made me feel better about when I get the crap talk in your accent. That's what I'm going to hear now is how, how dare they with their accent, you know, because you, you know, you're a little bit older than me and you've done a lot of great work and then someone will come and you know, it's, uh, how, how dare they say that to me, you know, and, and it's just like, it's the ego part of me, right? How dare they think that I'm talking smack, you know, but the thing is, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just only speaking from my experience the best that I can. So that's going to help me personally. So thank you. Yeah, you don't level yourself onto that level. And not if you feel superior, you're also on a wrong, uh, one is also on the wrong level. But you just know, I also see sometimes, because all these, um, and I, I'm surprised in, uh, I was a bit 
um, what's the word, afraid, I was nervous of getting a lot of negative comments on my videos. So I blocked my first years of videos. There are no comments allowed because I didn't want to deal with that. And it's only recently that I allowed comments and they have been 99% or positive. They are very occasionally a negative one. But you see it very clearly. They come from such a screwed up frame of mind. You don't have to feel superior. You feel not sorry, but you feel that they, they, need, they, they don't need my judgment because, boy, they have a tough life. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that's all the, all the hatred on, 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 uh, on, on Twitter and so on comes from people who are really, really in, in, in a very difficult uh, frame of mind in their condition. So they need our love and, and our blessings, but not our condemnation and our, our counter hate or counter answer even. So it's easy not to reply or send them, thank you so much for your input. Best wishes, loving, many blessings. So that's it. I love you and whatever. That's, that's, uh, that's it. And, uh, there are so many of them in the internet, but I'm, I'm surprised I didn't get that many, but I do get them once in a while as well. Yeah, I think that's an important part and not to go too deep into this, but it is important. You know, it's, you're talking about compassion and when I've received them, they've been very, of all the comments, just a few, but they hit me right in the feelings. And then I want to basically invite them to where I am and then fist fight first and then we'll sort it out. But that's not the way to go. But that's the first reaction. So then it takes me some... Yeah, right. You know, I'm martial arts, so I gotta I'll punch you in the eye for that. You know, it's a very male, primal, masculine. Some of the people on the podcast I've talked to in person are like, Well, you're like a lot more like intense than you you can be on the I'm like, Yeah, I've had to train that like masculine caveman Bigfoot out of me. You know, that's always the first thing is just to beat them with a blunt object. Um, so, so through work that I realized that's not the way to go. And when I take that time and that step back and I reply with kindness and compassion, you know, understanding, try to get their view, they open up. And just like a child that is reaching out in a class, they, you have no idea where they're coming from. They're actually reaching out. They're throwing these darts and they're kind of like with their negativity, they know something's not right. So they're shooting out darts and hooks to get checked, but this is where they're coming from. So that's, I think, a, you know, a good understanding when people are doing that, that they're checking and it's, you don't need to, you don't need to even agree with them. You don't need to, you know, take their crap. It's just, it's just treating them with kindness. And then that example of kindness shows them something else because if they're met with anger in that same level, they're learning the same thing. Um, and so from this, I'd let you can add on to that, but I, you said something about um, the law of absolute or absolute law. I'm wondering if you could talk on that and then maybe other universal laws and the connection with God, because we talked about that a little bit. And I don't know if it's one same circle or three different videos, but I feel like you would be a good guy to speak on those topics. Well, we'll see what comes up. The one thing I wanted to add about um, the negative um, uh, comments we get, uh, I like the, uh, the, this quote from Course in Miracles. There are only two actions. One is crying out for love and one is giving love. And all these negative comments are crying out for love. There's just no exception. And when we see that as a crying out for love, we can respond to it very, very differently. And we can give what, whatever needs to be done in a way it is. So that is very helpful. The absolute law, which I think is another word for God, which is basically love. And this is the absolute heaven, the absolute, which everything is in absolute uh, and harmony. If these are the heaven very briefly, I mean, it's a seven dimensional uh, in, uh, existence, which is difficult for us to understand but it is the center of central sun with the seven prism sun around and all the different universes around it. It's continuously rotating, continuously growing, and it is only based on the love frequency, which means there is no shadow. There's also neg no negativity because it doesn't need negativity. It is just growth, it's evolution, continuous evolution. Evolution doesn't involve uh, what Darwin has said about this, uh, the survival of the fittest and so on, it's always PS and so on. I have an animal video on this one. E evolution happens gradually and so on. It doesn't need to the, the survival of the fittest. Um, and it doesn't happen in six days either, like some Christians believe it. But uh, so that is basically the absolute law which we were part of or which we are born. This is where we, all the spiritual beings like you and I and everybody else came from. And there was at the beginning the choice to make this that some people wanted, some souls wanted, some spiritual beings wanted a different universe, a different, wanted to become like God. This was a story of Lucifer, whatever we want, the parallel or whatever it is. So a lot of so, uh, spiritual beings separated themselves 
and they are now living in the temporary universe because eventually they all will return. And this is a story of the prodigal son, Jesus' prodigal son, famously went out into the world, got lost, and eventually comes back into the open arms of the father. This is basically what we all are doing. We are basically at the moment on, down here outside of the pure heavens, and we are slowly working ourselves back into the pure heavens again to become love again, because only then can we enter the pure heavens. We have to carry the kingdom within to become attracted to the kingdom, and the kingdom is love. So it's basically very, very simple. And outside of this pure heavens is the causal, uh, causal law, which is a cause and effect, the karmic. It doesn't exist in the pure heaven because it doesn't need to. Everything happens in the constant now. Here we have delays, we have got time, we have got etc., etc. So it is a very different kind of universe with the seven layers here, purification spheres. And that's where we are now tumbling at the moment and we want eventually to return back. And we don't have to make it a major kind of, uh, um, how shall I say, a, a major kind of um, difficult path. The path is very simple. It is, it doesn't, you don't even need to understand anything what I've just said. The path is God is within. The God, the, the divine love is within. The kingdom is within. So whenever we really want to link with the strongest energy ever. We don't have to sit on mountain. We don't have to visit gurus. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to chant to sing. Go within, close your eyes, go within to the right and in. In a humble, quiet um, connection and be with that energy, that divine energy. If we make one step towards God, he makes a thousand steps towards us. So I think that is the important thing that whatever we have, any problems we have, I just made a video on addiction, which is very, very important which I didn't realize when I made this video about this coming to God in this rather humble way, whenever we feel we are tempted by something which we no longer wish to do. Um, and after I did the video, I realized it was basically the 12-step program. And there was also the book of uh, was it Russell Brand, who just came out. I read that afterwards and said, oh my God, this is the whole thing. And I got this from a spiritual revelation from God directly. Not, not me, but someone else got it and I read it. So it is all very simple. We don't have to do much. All we have to do is move within, go within. It's, it's, not, it's not all that difficult. A lot of spiritual path, a lot of gurus, a lot of people, and so make it very complicated, this and that, etc. But the steps are very easy. And the same is, if you, I'm sure you're familiar with Ho'oponopono, which seems to be very similar, like what you're teaching now, the three, the three, four words is, I love you, please forgive me, I'm sorry, and thank you. Say this to everybody you meet. This is, this is the essence. This is basically, if we do that quietly in our mind to everyone else, we clear, we clear, we clear, we really uh, move on. So the whole spiritual path is very simple, very direct, very, not easy, because our ego doesn't want us to do that. But our soul and our heart wants it. The spiritual world is surrounding us, is helping us. The spiritual world is nothing else but service. They're here to service us, to help us, to give us all the help we want. All we have to do is to ask. The same, like I said earlier, with death, when we die and they see these angels, we have to ask them, we have to allow them to lead us, and so on. They have, because otherwise they interfere with our free will. We have the free will to say no, and we don't want it. I want to have my beer, my alcohol, whatever it is, forget it. So, yes, that free will is yours, and you will have the consequences. It's fine. There is no punishment in the universe. It's only consequences. And everything we do will have its consequences, and we will learn from it or not, and we'll learn later then. So that was all I can think at the moment. <laughs> that was wonderful. Really, gr yeah, amazing. I, I totally agree with that. You know, it is a simple path. The teachings, if you read a bunch of teachings, and uh, I was just in Utah, and, and I've not, I'm Canadian, so going to a place where a whole state is essentially Mormon, every single person you have, and I'm like, oh, you're, I, I don't know how to phrase this, like, softly. Um, but they have a very, it's very rigid, you know what I mean? And, and you don't think outside. And I know exactly how that is designed. I know how you design that. That's how Hitler, I was curious about how World War II, I looked at indoctrination and philosophy. You know, if like you, all of your friends and your family and all of your community believes a thing. Um, not to say Mormon isn't wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the ability to have another lens and to look at it um, openly and does it allow you more freedom or or more not you know more 
whatever, you know, and you can see these things, but you can see when I'm having a conversation because I, I travel the world and I have different conversations with a lot of different people. And if you're happy and you seem aware and you seem aligned in which you do, and I'm looking right at you and we're having a conversation, it looks like you feel good. It looks like you generally have a good life. It looks like you go through crap like everybody else does, but it's this open, it, there's a vibration, there's an energy to it. And sometimes we can get kind of stuck in a way, and I can't even remember where I was going to go with that, but it was something um, which is being very specific and, and rigid in the, in the spiritual path where people are really seeking a connection. And I think that's beautiful and it gets you closer to what you think is God beautiful, but it's not an easy path, right? Just because it's, oh yeah. So if you look at all these different mindsets, you know, Buddhism, Christianity, you know, there are missing books to the Bible. It's what I believe. Um, right. And you have all these things and you cut it and it's like, you know, it's only, I see martial arts. It's only karate. No, it's only jujitsu. No, it's only boxing. No, they're all ways. They're all different ways. And we can, um, pick from each one, but at the core of it is about self development. It's not about beating the crap out of your neighbor. It's not about boxing is better than jujitsu. So I beat you up for it. It's like, I'm developing myself. And then you go over to the Muslim is like, Oh, I'm developing myself too. This is how I connect. And I think that that is the path and the way that you explained it is very beautifully. It's, it's, it's very simple. It's, it's going in and that way you don't need um, a book or a philosophy or a doctrine or anything outside of you to have your own spiritual sovereignty. You have a right to be here on this universe. You are spiritually sovereign. You are all the technology, information, knowledge that you need to have a real connection with God, whatever that is for you. Now, if these philosophies can serve and grow that, great. But it is in you and in each individual. And I think that some of those philosophies will say this is the way and nobody else gets, you know, Roger Rabbit on the other side. Um, so it's a really, really important thing. And you feel it within, you know. I know I have a connection with the universe because of how I live. And I'm not specifically religious. I'm extremely spiritual, whatever the heck those two sound vibrations mean to you. You know, it doesn't matter. And when you said uh, we take one step towards God, he takes a thousand towards us is really beautiful. And so I'll see if you want to add on to that rant. And I, then I have a question. Uh, no, come with a question. I uh, enjoy listening to you. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, so I think it's really important. You know, we have these, we have um, a lot of issues today. Um, lots of addictions. Like you said, the me I've been aware of this for a while and not sure what to do. So I'm so grateful you're making videos and, and putting out content so we can be aware of an issue and then provide solutions for them. And that's what yours do. You know, if, if you're just hating on something, so you're providing solutions, which I think is important. Do you just want to give some brief advice for somebody who's addicted? They can't break that addiction, cigarettes, smoking, alcohol, drugs, you know, what did you deduce in that book in those videos? Just a little bit of help for somebody who just, they can't break it. Cause I have people in my life that get stuck in addiction. Sometimes I get stuck in it. My best way is fasting. I don't know why just two days. You think that you can't eat, but there's some magic to fasting. I just do whether it's coffee or whatever it is. If I just don't eat for two days, something happens in my body where I'm able to reset. And so whatever that, and I just had one of my, um, you know, students and clients, you know, Jordana, she's amazing. And she just was stuck on chocolate. It's like, just fast for two days. It's like magic. And she did it. And then she said on the third day, she's like staring at chocolate and she wants it. And she's like, just shopping around in there, you know, just, like, just, just, just shopping around and just probably like want to eat it all, but is able to walk away. And before that, impossible. So for me, it does something. And that's just one thing that, that I find helps. So maybe you can share what, what you've come to. Well, it's interesting you mentioned it after I made my video. I was, I'm not an expert on, on the 12-step uh, program and so on. I just made this video according to that uh, revelation. But uh, one of the uh, viewers sent me an email and says, oh, she did the 30-day water cure. Uh, only, only water cure. I never heard of this. And I'm not going to recommend this, but you can look it up or Google it. And basically, you drink water for 30 days or what only, etc. Basically, what you're saying, you really change your whole physical body that way. I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm, I never heard about it, but it is similar what you say, two days no eating, etc. Because the whole things change in that way. But I don't think that is necessarily the answer. It would be, it would be much better to find out what is the hole that we're trying to fill. fill. Because whatever it is, whatever we take to with alcohol or internet or whatever it is, 
there is a hole in us that we want to fill with with a substitute and that is something which as i said um i would strongly suggest uh, to always consider the 12-step programs of all different forms they are there available for even for internet now and they may not work the first time sometimes people have to go two or three times before they really help them particularly with alcohol and drugs and so on but it is the inner inner connection with god to to where the that is the strongest power and again i'm not speaking from experience here that's why i have i'm a bit careful with the choosing of my um, uh, choice of choice of my words because when you are really as seriously addicted as I've seen people are, ah, oof, I don't know where, how I get out of it. I, I, I don't know. But for the little problems I have had, etc., going within, asking for help, seriously for help, it was there. It lasted for a long time. It doesn't necessarily cure me. But I know that help, if it helps me for small steps, etc., will also be there for long steps. That I'm convinced of. If ever I go down deep end on some kind of extreme uh, addiction, I know that that is in me and it's not out there somewhere. So that is, and in my video, I go into a little bit like remove yourself from yourself, look at yourself without judging yourself. What are the things which, which you find uh, should be changed and so on, and then bring them to God and, 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 and discuss it with him and speak with him and feel, uh, see how you feel. There's also the, uh, the element of remorse uh, that you have, have obviously hurt people, etc., in your process by being addicted, etc., and you have hurt yourself. Uh, that uh, remorse and repentance is very important. We, uh, uh, particularly even in forgiveness, I uh, make a video on lifeexplained.com on forgiveness, the point of remorse or repentance is often for ignored with new, new age teachers and so on. They just forgive and etc. fine. No, you have to really feel uh, as much as you can the pain you have given other people, you might have given other people, for the simple reason you have to store it in your body. So next time you're tempted to take another alcohol, this comes back. It's like you have, you have hurt yourself uh, with that thing. So that is part of the quite physical law why repentance and deep remorse is so important, that we store this memory in our whole system, in our soul, in our body, so then we are tempted next time that we may not do it. So just without remorse and without repentance, forgiveness often doesn't last. So that's an important step. Uh, but I would say anybody with the addictions, I think uh, I took it uh, took some time to write it very carefully in my video uh, on addiction in lifeexplained.com. You find it uh, in ten minutes explained in a much clearer way than I can probably now repeat it and remember it because I'm working on other videos. My mind is already on other stuff. <laughs> awesome. Well, though, yeah, those are really good. Those are really good insights, and I think even just the basic one of asking for help. Um, you know, you could ask your commu community for help. You, you know, even you can ask a, a, a and I do believe there are sp this spiritual help, um, you know, asking, but you have to actually ask, y yeah. you know, the way that that works in, you know, sovereign being, you got to ask, please help me with this um, thing that I'm going through. Please, I'll ask for guidance. Um, and you could also write it down. That's how they work too. writing it down and saying it out loud because we're a closed system. Um, that's my belief anyway. And you can pray too, but out loud and, and, uh, writing it down definitely can't hurt. And then asking someone that you think cares about you. You know, I think a lot of people are really resistant to just, you know, to asking for help. They're just go through their own suffering. Ask your mom, your sister, your brother, a friend, just say, I need help. You know, they'll help you to have faith in your community, but have the courage to ask. And I know it does take courage. So, um, well, it's a of humility, it's a, a lesson of humility. Yeah. Yeah, so I think those are beautiful points. My friend, this has been magical. It's everything that I, that I hoped it would be. Now, this, I didn't tell you this at, at the beginning. Um, I never just shut it down. Is there anything that you wish that I had asked you or that you want to talk about? That is something that inspired you that you wanted to share? The floor is yours. You can, you can go down there. And if not, then no, you... I think I, I, I said a lot. <laughs> yeah, you said so much. to see more on lifeexplained.com there is uh, many more videos if they're not tired of me <laughs> beautiful beautiful well thank you so much for coming is there anything any last message that you want to leave the listeners with before we close it out it sounds so simple and it sounds maybe not important but it is the most important thing love nothing else just love it's nothing else 
Beautiful. Thank you, brother. Well, thank you for your work. I highly recommend everybody check out your YouTube and your videos. Um, I'll just put, I just went on Steemit. So I'll just put that out there. Somebody kept telling me to put my stuff on Steemit. It's like a cryptocurrency blog. So you can post all your videos there. And if people upvote them, then somehow through some sort of cryptocurrency magic, you get um, money which is cool. And so your videos are great. So if you can get some abundance from the universe for all the good things you do, maybe it's something that the, I'm sure the community over there would um, endorse. And so people like you should be supported because it is a very beautiful work and it's helping a lot of people. So I just wanted to honor you and thank you for everything that you're putting out there. Same you. Thank you, mate. I appreciate it. Right. Take care. Okay. See everybody. Bye. Peace.